Uh, so the first question this morning, as a lay person, what would be a realistic spiritual goal that we should aim to achieve in this lifetime? <clears throat> well, the, um, the Buddhist um, uh, discovery of um, the nature of the human mind and the possibility and the nature of enlightenment um, allowed him to distinguish um, four stages of enlightenment. So the ultimate stage, um, as you probably know, is called arahantship. So one becomes arahant. That's the highest spiritual goal. And that, of course, is, is very difficult to realize. And very few monks, um, with all of the supporting conditions, uh, will ever realize that goal. Um, but the first level of enlightenment, um, <clears throat> which um, we translate into English as stream entry, in Thai we say sodaban, Pali is sodabana. Um, and that, that, that literally means stream enterer or one who enters the stream. And the reason for the, um, for that particular image is that, um, one who realizes that, um, first level of enlightenment is, is guaranteed. It is inevitable that he or she will realize the highest level of arahantship within at most seven lifetimes. So it, it's um, a definite end to uh, this um, revolving in, in um, samsara for so many, 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 many lifetimes. Uh, the significance of this is expressed very well when uh, the Buddha and put his hand into the, the dirt, and he got some dirt under his fingernail. And he said to um, Ananda, the monk with him, he said, um, which, is, which is more, you know, the, the, the amount of earth under my fingernail or the amount of earth in the whole world? It's one of those kind of funny questions he asked him. And, of course, Ananda says, well, obviously the amount of um, earth in the world is no comparison. And the Buddha said, similarly, um, for one who has realized stream entry, then the amount of um, suffering that remains before arahantship is like the earth under the fingernail. That's all that's left compared with all the suffering in the past, the experience, all the suffering experienced in the future, like all the earth in, or all the earth in the whole, whole world. Now, this state of stream entry um, is one that was realized um, by many lay Buddhists at the time of the Buddha and indeed throughout Buddhist history. And the Buddha made it clear that um, to realize this stage, then the five precepts um, forms a sufficient ethical basis uh, for the um, spiritual development that will result in stream entry. So it is accessible for someone living life in the world. Again, not easy at all, but um, I think perhaps in some ways we could say in the present day, um, easier than any time in history. Um, at least for half the human race, which is to say for women. I mean, this is an uh, absolute golden age uh, to be a woman in the world. Um, if you look at the, the, the life of women in the past and the, uh, the amount of freedom they had to pursue um, their own um, goals and dreams and um, spiritual ideals, um, it's never, um, 
approach the, the amount of, of freedom and autonomy that you have today. And the, uh, in the look in history, um, uh, most women would be, um, whether they liked it or not, would be married off and would have a number of children by your age even, um, in their twenties already. Um, and a life as a, as a mother, as a worker would have been pretty well mapped out. Um, but now with the changes in society and the opportunity for women to have a good education and to, um, make their own way in the world, uh, without the legal or the social pressures on them to marry early, um, with the, um, with development of contraception, meaning can choose to have a family or not to have a family whenever, um, whenever you want in the childbearing period. It means that, uh, also in the, the capitalist system, particularly if you have a sufficient, um, income or you're not, um, you know, uh, short of the, the basic necessities of life, then you can make life choices in a way that you could not in the past. You can choose to, a uh, career in which maybe there's less stress, maybe less income, but in which you can live a life in harmony with your spiritual goals. So, um, to, for a lay person, man or woman, to realize stream entry as a lay person, it does mean a, um, a way of life which is in harmony with the practice of Dhamma. So applying some of the principles um, of, can see from monastic life and, and applying them in such a way as that you have sufficient time, sufficient um, solitude, the ability to um, go to monasteries or listen to Dhamma talks and to um, practice on retreat and extended periods um, in which you have a lifestyle which is not in conflict um, with development in Dhamma. So uh, I would say that for, for men or for women, particularly if you're in the middle class or upper middle class where you have a certain uh, financial um, stability already, um, living in a Buddhist country with access to teachers and teaching, um, then Stream entry is not an over-ambitious goal to establish for yourself. Um... Why does my leg always go numb when I meditate? It used to be my right leg, but now it's my left. It doesn't feel like the usual retina that I feel when I meditate. Yeah, it, it's um, leg going to sleep is absolutely normal um, and completely harmless and nothing to, to worry about at all. And, uh, even these days, my leg goes to sleep sometimes if I uh, sit in the, in the wrong way. Or it's not necessarily the wrong way, but um, if it is a real um, problem for you, you can experiment in just the way of sitting and the way you place your legs. Um, usually as having something just to prop yourself up at the back helps to keep a straight back and, and um, helps that. But the... The, the height of the, the support at the back, um, whether you sit in full lotus, half lotus, or, or like Burmese style with the legs not crossed, one in front of the other. You can experiment, but, but, uh, basically it, it's, um, just a blood flow, um, problem, but not anything which is dangerous to health. And, um, just, uh, don't, don't worry about it would be my, my basic advice. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, is it necessary to have a focal point when we meditate? Why can't we be aware of our whole body at all time? Um, there's two questions here. F first of all, then, um, generally speaking, for, for the mind to be able to become more subtle and for samadhi uh, to occur, um, the mind has to be one-pointed. Um, so it has, it has to have a single object, a single focus. Um, but if you find that that, um, like full body awareness, um, suits you and, and you feel, um, present and you have good mindfulness in that state, then you can, you can carry that on, um, and fully develop that. Um, but sooner or later, as the mind becomes uh, more um, has the mindfulness become stronger? There is this natural movement towards a single a single object. So, so I would say for the the um, the next stages of meditation, then a single focus is is um, is better. But that um, that kind of full body focus is very very relaxing and very uh, enjoyable and. Uh, at the end of the day, as they say, the most important thing is you find a way to enjoy meditation. Because if you, if you feel like meditation is like a chore or it's like a bit of medicine, you think it's good for you, but you know, it's kind of tough. You don't, um, you won't keep it up long run. So you have to find a way of really seeing the value of it, enjoying it. And this full body focus is, um, is, is just very enjoyable, really. Um, if you give it a try and you keep at it. Um, why do I sometimes get goosebumps when I inhale during meditation or when Prajan teaches? That, that, uh, goosebumps are like first, like preliminary, um, uh, expressions of piti or rapture. So th this is, um, one of the, um, Things that happen as you become more sensitive and you become more focused, then you can have these feelings of rapture arising. And they take many different forms, some of them quite unexpected. The obvious, quite obvious things you can find, um, just, um, like tears in your eyes, tears of joy. Um, sometimes it's like a sort of a wave of, of rapture passes through your body. Uh, sometimes like, um, hairs coming up and goosebumps. Um, I know some monks, it's like a party trick. They can, they can just make the hair on their arms just come up like this, like volunteer, you know, can, can produce that kind of bitti and, and make the, the hair rise on their arms. And so it's kind of, kind of monk party trick. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, the, um, uh, the more prof uh, but sometimes these, um, Expressions of bhiti would not immediately sound like very enjoyable. Sometimes, uh, have feelings of like things crawling all over you, like ants crawling all over you. But in the, in the textbooks, that would be classified as one of the, the, uh, bhiti or rapture school, uh, group of phenomena. So it's all the, it is kinds of, um, special emotional kinds of phenomena that arise as the mind becomes more focused. Um, but as the mind enters into deeper states of samadhi, then there's a much more profound level of, of bhiti. So there are two things that at least, uh, as the mind becomes very focused, and one is bhiti and one is sukha. So bhiti and sukh. So you might have, um, uh, some doubt as how do you distinguish between the two of them, between rapture and, and bliss or happiness? And the, the analogy, um, in the, um, in the books, in the, in the commentaries is of someone walking through the desert and they're so tired and they're so thirsty. Um, and, you know, in a terrible, uh, state and then, uh, climb to the top of a sand dune and then see an oasis. And it's after so dry, all the throat's dry and so hot, and then you see the oasis. 
and you walk towards the oasis. Now, those feelings as you see the oasis in your uh, in in front of you, and you walk towards the oasis, that's called piti. And then when you get to the oasis and you actually drink the water, bathe in the water, then that's sukha. So, so piti is is um, slightly more uh, is more disturbing. It's less peaceful than sukha. So, for someone who is has reached the levels of jhana in samadhi, as the mind becomes increasingly refined, then piti will disappear and 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 um, leave sukha. And then the next stage after that, even sukha disappears, um, and then there's um, only equanimity or evenness of mind. So there's a kind of a gradual evolution of the mind as it becomes more and more subtle, and uh, and the more coarse things fall away, um, stage by stage um, through that. But goosebumps are kind of like the initial sense that um, in, medita- in meditation or we're sitting like this, we become very sensitive, and sometimes. Um, if a teacher is teaching something and it goes right to your heart in a way that if you're just listening on to an iPod in your car or, or, or something that you, it would be the same words, but it wouldn't have the same effect because you're not in that state in which you are receptive to it. Um, whatever I do, I can't seem to detect the breath at my nose. I know that I'm breathing, but I can't feel myself doing it, even when I'm not meditating. Is this because my sati and samadhi aren't good enough? Should I use my belly instead of the tip of my nose instead? Also, in my past meditation camp experiences, I've experienced sudden anger that you mentioned last night at the place, people around me, and sometimes the prajam. At this camp, however, I haven't had any extreme cases of um, mental agitation, sleepiness, or bursts of anger. I feel no different when meditating from leading a normal daily life. Again, this is because my sati and samadhi are not balanced. Um... Uh, as I, um, as I mentioned, the, um, in, in the mindfulness of breathing, we, we choose the, the focus at wherever the, uh, sensation of the breath is strongest and, um, most comfortable to focus upon. So, uh, although for most people, then that area will be around the tip of the nose, sometimes within the nose, in in the nostril, sometimes around the the, the upper lip. But this is just for for most people. It's not like um, a, a law or it's not a fixed thing. And um, some people um, will be aware of the breath in the chest area, and some people in the abdomen. And there's, there's no right or wrong place to, to be aware of the breath. So if, if there's no kind of interest and, and, um, find not, um, possible to meditate on the breath at the nose, um, then where, where is the breath manifesting? Where, where can you be aware of the breath? Um, but if you do wish to, um, develop the mindfulness of breathing at the tip of the nose, then a um, very simple method is just to breathe a few times through the nose, um, sort of long, deep breaths, until you get a sense of where where the sensation um, appears when the breath is coarse, and then try to focus on that particular uh, point. Um, as regards the um, arising of, of anger and sleepiness, and these are things that, that occur when we go against the grain. These are all the 
symptoms of the mind being shocked out of its usual habits. Um, so meditation, particularly if you're, you know, if you don't meditate at home and, uh, and come on a course, then it's like shock therapy. You know, it's like being thrown in at the deep end. And so there will be these kinds of, kind of strong reactions of, uh, sometimes of anger and sleepiness and, and, uh, all kinds of different, uh, phenomena. Um, but the, um, so in, in this case, I'm not sure whether the, the, um, the writer is meditating, um, in a, a, at home and have developed, um, a certain level of mindfulness or whether it is because the lack of focus on the meditation object has meant that uh, the mind is just kind of still pretty well wandering where it, where it, where it wants and there's no going against the grain or stirring up of things which are in the mind. Um, so, it, yes, it may well be um, lack of sati um, or um, not really... Um, going against the stream of, of thought and memory and imagination to which most of us are addicted. Then the, uh, the, the second question is how to solve the fifth uh, Niwarana. Um, the writer has translated this as curiosity, but actually curiosity is not a hindrance. It's quite a good thing. Uh, to be curious is um, quite helpful. Um, but in this hindrance, um, it's a little bit difficult to translate, but it's more, um, I, I guess a modern way of talking about it is like a, an unwillingness to commit to something rather than, um, uh, curiosity or, or a doubt in its normal, uh, means. But so it's important to see doubt as a mental state, because we tend to identify with doubt very much. We feel, I'm doubting about this. I'm not sure about the meditation. I'm not sure about the teaching on this and on that. Um, and, <clears throat> and when we think like that, you know, we, we tend to really identify with it very strongly. The thing is, it's me who's thinking. But in fact, it's just another, like, knee-jerk, reaction from the mind um, put under some pressure uh, by not being able to follow its usual habits. So um, when we, uh, as I explained um, yesterday, yesterday, I think, there is a room for doubt if you take on a particular practice um, uh, there and you have some, some parts of it that you're not sure about. Then there is a time and a place to uh, sit down and think that through and to speak with other people about it or to read up about it. Um, but there has to also comes a point where you have to say, right now I have to make a decision and now I have to just give myself to this for a certain length of time, put it to the test. So the hindrance comes up where, where, um, you, you've made that kind of decision and you've made a certain kind of commitment, but then, you know, you don't want to go too far in case you've got it wrong. You don't want to miss out on something. You want to, um, there's certain things, guarantees that you want, and certain kinds of certainties that you crave, which are just not possible to, um, to realize. So seeing doubt just as the same way as we see a, uh, and any kind of positive, negative emotion in the mind, we're learning to see um, impermanent phenomena as impermanent phenomena and not to identify with them, make too much out of them. And this uh, is exactly the same strategy that we adopt for, um, for skeptical doubt or Um, I often find myself falling asleep during sitting meditation. Uh, how can I combat this? 
yeah. Um, well, there are a number of, uh, of points for this. Sometimes falling asleep is very simply because uh, we're not um, getting enough sleep um, generally. If, you're, for instance, um, if you're in a strange place, unfamiliar place, if you usually uh, sleep alone and you're with a, a group of other people or um, there are various, um, you're getting, you're sleeping, getting up at times that you're not familiar with, um, affects your sleep patterns. And so you, uh, is quite, that's quite likely going to affect you during a meditation session. Um, so that's, that's one kind of physical reason, uh, physical tiredness. But, um, the, the addiction we have to uh, mental phenomena, having something, anything at all going on in our head all of the time, um, means that the only time we really experience uh, a lack of anything going on um, is when we're about to sleep. So when we meditate on the breath or whatever, and we're not giving a mind a lot of interesting things to think about, um, then this kind of automatic reaction sets in and the brain tells us it's time to go to sleep. So it, and it takes um, quite some time and patient effort to be able to go beyond that. But there's also the, um, the attitude that we bring to meditation. Um, if we're looking at meditation as just a, a, like a relaxation technique, um, then after the initial uh, physical discomfort and the uh, agitation and feng san in the mind um, start to recede, then if if our underlying attention is just to kind of bliss out or just to relax, um, then often we'll get sleepy, um, which is why it's so important to understand that what we're trying to do is develop this wakefulness, this bright, calm, sharp alertness of mind, um, independent of um, situations. And th this is what we're trying to develop. So um means if the mind is really agitated, then we're trying to develop that calm, sharp, clear, bright kind of mind that is aware of agitation. And then when there's no agitation, there's still that bright, sharp, clear uh, mind which is aware of lack of agitation. So the effort is always to sustain this clear, wakeful knowing. And um, the word Buddha uh, means uh, awake, the awakened one. And that's the very quality, that quality of uh, awakening, wakefulness in the mind. So this is a long way away from just sort of blissing out on, on a, you know, a, a non, uh, agitated, non stressful, uh, mental state. That's still, just, just still going round and round in the cycle. So yo yo kind of, um, um, mental state. So as long as you indulge in mental states, um, then you're always going to be the prisoner of them and always going to be um, going up and down, up and down. But the freedom is knowing a mental state for what it is. Oh, yeah, this is anxiety. Yeah, it's like this. It arises like this and it has this kind of um, quality and it passes away like this. Um, and this is uh, anger and this is greed and this is kindness, and this is patience, and positive and negative qualities. We're, we're learning to see them for what they are. Uh, what is Buddhism's view on mental illness? Well, I, I don't know that they can really summarize it as Buddhism's view. Um, I I would say that's my view. Okay, my view as a one Buddhist monk. Um, well, I, I can say that generally speaking, um, the Buddhist view is that 
um, everyone uh, short of um, enlightened beings um, are mentally ill, um, full of mind, full of mental distortion. So that's just kind of normality. Like the, the normality for um, the vast majority of the human race is, is abnormality for someone who's um, realized the truth of things. But um, there are, of course, a spectrum. Um, there's like high functioning abnormality. Um, and then there is um, crippling abnormality. Um, and then we get into the realms of very serious um, mental illness. But uh, mental illness is, is a difficult um, topic to talk about. Um, for instance, if you, if you look at the, um, the classic textbook of psychiatry, um, which is produced in, in America, I can't remember the name of this book now, um, but if you look at the successive editions that have come out in the past 50 years, the, the book has got thicker and thicker and thicker. So now there are a huge number of, of um, phenomena which are classified as mental illnesses, which were not classified as such 50 years ago. So the question is, what is a mental illness? Where, is, where do you draw the line? Where do you say that's an illness that needs treatment? Um, and there is a um, school of thought. There, there is, I think, quite a lot of evidence supporting this view that um, ideas of, of mental illness uh, have been very much affected by pharmaceutical companies, uh, that pharmaceutical companies produce drugs and have a certain effect, and then... They say people that um, lack that effect have an illness, and this medicine will cure it. So it's like drugs are coming first, and then the uh, definitions of mental illness are following from the drugs. Um, <clears throat> and certain things that um, you, you know uh, would never be considered as illnesses before, say in the, before we say, oh, someone's like shy or. Uh, you know, sort of ki ai or uh, uh, brahma or something like this, and just go like, yeah, that's their that's their personality. But now it becomes called a syndrome. You know, so you have like a social anxiety syndrome, which needs a particular kind of drug to take it away. So, from the vast kind of um, diversity of human personality types, um, now we're being told that. Uh, this is this is something that needs to be treated with a drug. You shouldn't have that. You shouldn't be like that. So, so this is why, um, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say what's um, Buddhism's uh, view on on mental illness. I mean, my my view is that um, a lot of things that are considered to be mental illnesses these days are, um, and need to be treated by drugs then, uh, wouldn't really fulfil my idea of what mental illness is and the um the overuse and over prescription of drugs um for mental phenomena which people don't don't like or that they're just kind of awkward um uh is a very dangerous development in in our society and the whole thing about with children particularly i mean that we've now got um children and like drugged and uh, drugged up in a in a horrifying way um children pronounced to have uh, this syndrome and that syndrome and 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 being given all kinds of, of drugs i mean the ritalin the drug which is given for you know for hyperactive children is in fact um a, a very strong um stimulant it's like a yamba you know, something like that but it has a different effect on, on children. But So the question is that sometimes uh, with behavioral um, problems, um, then people just, it's just kind of a, you know, tiring or, or difficult children are now uh, being called ill and having some something which needs a drug to care for it. So that, again, is something I think we really need to look into a lot more closely. Um, and the 
the power of the pharmaceutical corporations these days is is tremendous um, and really needs to be monitored more closely. <clears throat> How should we keep up our practice after re we return home? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, in, in some ways, um, again, you know, the, the advantages of modern um, times, social media, that you can set up groups, you know, you have all kinds of groups out there. Um, and uh, you have a, a meditator's group. Um, which you can share teachings and which you can share experiences and give support to each other because it's difficult for everyone uh, to sustain a meditation practice. But if you have a group of friends who are also trying to do the same thing and you keep in touch with each other, then that's, um, I think, can be very helpful. Um, budgeting and, and um, putting aside time every year um, for... Um, meditation retreats or for visiting monasteries or for visiting teachers, but also to, to develop a, um, a daily meditation practice. And I would suggest that the best time for that is early morning, first thing when you get up. Um, because if you do it in the early morning, it's very quiet. You don't have a lot on your mind in the way that you, in the way that you might do in the evening. Um, and importantly, um, after the end of the meditation, then you can, you have some way of observing whether it does in fact have a positive effect on your life. So if you meditate in the morning and you notice you feel a bit calmer, more at peace, more mindfulness, more patient, and so on, then that will give you the motivation. Uh, to carry carry on, it's good to um, make a kind of a, a vow or a, um, an aditan uh, for a certain um, number of hours every week. Now, I, I'm not. I wouldn't recommend to make a, that kind of aditan for, on a daily basis because, particularly in the lay world, there'll be sometimes when that you have some some uh, social engagement or some traveling or all kinds of things which uh, may prevent you from keeping up um, every single day. But if you make the, the aditan for a week, then if you miss a day, then you can make it up a little bit longer on other days so that you can still sustain um, the length of time that you have decided would be appropriate. Uh, I've got a question of what is Jainism? Okay, so um, probably the um, golden age for religion and philosophy throughout the world was in the, the century when the Buddha was born. And so um, we look into in Greece and Socrates and China and Confucius, Buddha in India. But he wasn't the only um, great teacher at that time. And the other uh, very famous teacher in the same lived in the same area, same part of India. Um, many disciples was a teacher called Mahavira, and he was the founder of the Jain religion, lived more or less the same time as the Buddha, although it's not recorded they ever met. And um, he, he, his teaching and uh, Buddha's teaching varied a number of uh, respects, but they both rejected the caste system. So that was very important, critical of the caste system. But the way that the, the Jain uh, religion is uh, represented in the Buddha's um, words is that it's founded on some um, mistaken ideas. Uh, one is that by um, tormenting the body that you could sort of burn away the old kamma. Um, because if you understand that bad kamma is 
uh, manifests as painful feelings. And you say you've, you artificially create painful feelings and to burn off as much of the bad karma from the past as you can. Um, but the Buddha thought that that was a mistaken idea. Um, and he would um, point out that um, you don't have any idea how much bad karma in the past there is to burn off, uh, to what extent you're actually burning off bad karma by doing these things, and uh, also the kinds of mental defilements that arise while you're doing these things are newcomer that you're creating without realizing it. So he had many criticisms. Anyway, um, Jainism has survived to the present day, and I've met Jain monks in India. Um, Jain monks and nuns, uh, they, they're divided into two sects, probably most famously uh, the one sect, the monks uh, walk around completely naked. And I met them on, like, on Tudong in India, and just walking, um, and they have, um, often they'll have a cloth. The, the other main feature of Jainism is that they take the, uh, ahimsa, not killing, um, to, um, to great, to, you know, to in- incredible lengths. So every time you breathe in, tiny, tiny creatures in the air are being um, incinerated in your nose. So, um, so you know, from Buddhist point of view, it means you, you can never really be, uh, you know, live in a completely uh, non-harming way because you're burning up small creatures every time you breathe in, breathe out. But anyway, the, the Jain monks will have a cloth over their, their, their nose often to filter the air coming in. Their, their, their nose. They walk with a, a, a broom, so they walk along, so in case to prevent them from, um, treading on anything, um, carry a, carry a, just a kettle of water. So they have many different, um, uh, ascetic practices like this. But because there's so many, um, very kind of narrow, ex- um, and difficult, rules and regulations, expectations, it means that uh, Jainism has never spread out of that small area of India in which it first appeared. It doesn't have that kind of flexibility to uh, to spread throughout the world in the way that uh, Buddhism did. So I'm just going to carry on and, and read out the rest of these questions because we won't have another opportunity. Uh, what is the difference between Buddhist chanting and praying as in Christianity? Um, yeah, a- again, this is a difficult one to answer in, in that there are many different kinds of prayer in Christianity. So you have, um, we call like petitionary prayer, like prayer as petition, um, in which you uh, you pray to God and ask for things, basically. Um, so that's very, uh, that kind, there's no kind of um, relationship at all with that kind of prayer. But there are also a uh, prayer of praise of God. Um, and so there is a um, some relationship or some analogy with the uh, Buddhist chanting when we're praising the qualities of the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha. In certain kinds of um, prayer and, and um, hymn singing uh, are intended to bring up a sense of joy or, or piti, um and that's also can be a feature of some Buddhist chanting. Um, but the uh, in, in Christianity, there is also more what they call contemplative prayer. Um, and that, that kind of prayer is, is not very common at all in the Protestant denominations, um, but can still be found to a certain degree in the Catholic monastic orders and in the Orthodox Christian church. Um, one of a very inspiring book um, we used to have in a library in a monastery 
Uh, it's called the way the way of a pilgrim, and uh, is a like an autobiography biography of a a monk or a lay monk really uh, in Russia in the 19th century, and uh, he just walked on pilgrimage from a holy one holy place to another through Russia um, by foot, and all he had in his back I remember his back is this big loaf of black bread which he would chew on when he got hungry. And as he was walking through Russia, he would just have this prayer, like a uh, like a mantra, like a chant in his in his head, uh, over and over and over and over and over again. And in those days, in the Russian Orthodox Church, there there were some great masters and and people who meditated in the Christian way. And he went to see them and asked for teachings for them. So uh, that was the only time I think I've ever read a a Christian book and sort of really saw some. Um, correspondence to my own kind of life as a as a Buddhist monk. So, you know, re- remember when we're talking about Christianity, we're talking about so many different things, huge differences between Protestantism and Catholicism, and um, uh, and Orthodox Church in terms of doctrine and um, just about every everything. Um, so it it is. Um, important when we make these kinds of comparisons, we bear that in mind. What are your views on gender equality in Buddhism, in particular on women who wish to join the monkhood and walk on the same path to enlightenment as men? Um, Well, the, the Buddha um, made it very clear that um, women have exactly the same capacity for enlightenment as men. So there, there's no idea, there's never been any idea in Buddhism that women are spiritually inferior to men. So this has always been a, a problem in the Western culture, for instance, the idea that it's this story of God created Adam and then he created Eve from the rib of of uh, of Adam. So like woman's like an afterthought. She came afterwards to help look after Adam or whatever. Um, and, uh, to, and throughout Western history um, and throughout most of the world indeed, um, women have uh, been considered like the weaker sex or the inferior sex. And still, in in many parts of the world, that idea um, is still um, prevalent. That that idea um, has never, you know, as an idea, as a concept, um, as a kind of philosophical position, uh, has never been present in in Buddhism, at least. Um, but then, um, in any kind of society, the religious tradition is not the only factor in play. And um, for various social economic reasons, men have usually had power over women and then sought ways to justify that power. And that eventually has um, filtered into understanding of, of religion. So I, I would say, for, and Buddhism as well, but I would say in terms of gender equality, then, then the position is that men and women have equal capacity um, and it's uh, as fortunate to to be born as a woman as a man. But then we get into um, the questions of um, monastic um, order, the monastic order, and the opportunities for women to lead a monastic life. Um, and then there is um, some uh, disparity and some difficulty in that the, um, the time of the Buddha. There was a monk and uh, and a nun's order, a bhikkhu sangha and a bhikkhu ni sangha. Now, to th- uh, after a thousand years, which is a, a pretty successful lifespan um, for an or any kind of organization, uh, unprecedented, the bhikkhu ni order um, disappeared from India, um, and so. Uh, by the time the Theravada Buddhism came to Southeast Asia, um, there was no nun's order. 
And so um, that has obviously um, affected perceptions and, and the, the whole history of Buddhism in Southeast Asia because we don't have a kind of a, a memory of a golden age where there were monks and nuns and bhikkhus and bhikkhunis um, both flourishing in our country, in this country. So um, the um, the reason that um, well, once the the bhikkhuni order disappeared, then the um, sanghas, bhikkhu sanghas in various Theravada countries, came up with some kind of alternative um, opportunity, some alternative structure, and in Thailand. That took the form of the Mechi order. So the Mechi is not given the same kind of respect and, and, um, status as the monks, and which has, um, been, you know, one of the difficulties, certainly. Um, and the role of, of Mechis has never really been completely clarified or systematized. Um, now, um, the last 20 or more years, there have been a lot of efforts to revive the Bhikkhuni order, um, primarily led by Western academics and as a sort of one branch of uh, gender studies and, and the feminist movement and efforts to create a fairer um, society in which are equal opportunity for men and women. Um, and the problem being from the, um, the Bhikkhu Sangha in Burma and Thailand and Sri Lanka is that the, um, Theravada identity is based upon, um, keeping very strictly to the words of the Buddha as passed down in the Pali Canon. And in the Pali Canon, in the Pali scriptures, it's, uh, very clear that um, the bhikkhuni order cannot be uh, revived from scratch from um, um, for various technical reasons. I won't go into them all here. But that, that has been the um, assessment that it's not possible to revive the bhikkhuni order legitimately without ignoring or, or going against the words of the Buddha laid down in the Pali Canon. So, um, many scholars have been trying to get round this, um, and they've tried to find loopholes in this and ways that it could make it possibly, um, uh, allowable. And there are many, some of these interests could read some of these papers. Um, and there is, um, one of the most influential Ideas is that the bhikkhuni order in the Mahayana countries originated in Sri Lanka and therefore they are a, like a descendant of the Theravada order and that if women were to become nuns in the bhikkhuni order, then uh, Mahayana, they could be also considered to be Theravada nuns. There's also um, a monk in Sri Lanka who's been conducting bhikkhuni ordinations um, um, quite controversially and the number of bhikkhunis in, ordained in Sri Lanka has started to grow. So uh, it's a kind of, um, we're in a, position, uh, a period of flux and change now and how all this will work out over the next 50 years is, is unsure. Um, what I've observed in Thailand is that the the Mechi order has um, been strengthened and developed um, quite remarkably, I would say, over the past 10 years or so, so that the quality of, of education and quality of practice um, amongst the Thai Mechi um, um, community is, is now um, very worthy of respect. So, in answer to the question for, for Thai women, um, these days who, 
uh, feels a monastic vocation, then um, there are um, Mechi communities now um, which are um, inspiring and which are providing um, monastic education and training. But for someone who, who finds they would, it's very important for them to live the life of a bhikkhuni uh, rather than a mechi, then there are also those kinds of options becoming available now. Um, and it's, it's up to individual to, to look into the arguments and whether or not the bhikkhuni ordination is truly legitimate um, and how um, how stable and and um, uh, workable that um, bhikkhuni order in Thailand will be in the long term. So a lot of um, unresolved questions about that at the moment. I think, uh, speaking as a monk, the the you know the only um, you know comment I would have is that certainly in Western uh, academic community and amongst Western women. Then uh, monks become like the, the the villains, the bad guys uh, who are trying to sort of keep the women down and not let um, women have their full rights. And and um, that's certainly not my experience at all. And I think it's um, people are very very unfair towards the monks who, uh, for various reasons, are not in favour of revival of the bhikkhuni order. But it's much more based upon their uh, their faith and their um, commitment to the the Theravada tradition and the the Pali Canon um, than from any uh, dislike of women or uh, wish to prevent women from uh, reaching the same social status as the monks. Okay. So last English question. What does it mean when the Buddha says emptiness is emptiness? Well, I, I, I wasn't even aware he said that, to tell you this. Really. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's actually a website, um, and the whole website is about uh, all the things people said the Buddha said, but he didn't really say. So when these people say the Buddha said this, well, you can look it up on this website and see whether he did or not. Um, so, I, I mean, it's possible this is from uh, some Mahayana Sutra. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I know whoever wrote this can, um, if they want to, they can expand upon it. But uh, if I just um, explain what this word emptiness means, or, or sunyata, so it, it's a word that appears in in the uh, in the words of the Buddha, in the teachings in the Pali Canon, but uh, in the Mahayana tradition, it was taken up and became um, a kind of a philosophical concept, in a way um, that it wasn't in the time of the Buddha. So the time of Buddha, it was um, simply, I mean, like an absence of. So you could, we could say um, this uh, ban ban is is empty um, of the sound of traffic. You know, it means that the, uh, empty means there's just something that's not here. But in its most profound meaning, it's empty of the sense of me and mine. That, that's uh, how the Buddha used it in a more profound way. So this whole um, idea of, you know, we have this idea of me and mine, I and mine, and it, it, this is the very heart of our um, ignorance. So um, when we're with samadhi, we can start to really penetrate what this really means. What do we mean when we say, this is who I am, this is me, this is mine? Now, what, what does that mean? Or e even to say, like, this is my book. What, what does it mean? You know, <laughs> if you had to explain, let's, 
uh, let's say someone, a Martian came, you know, someone from another planet, okay, doesn't know anything about humanity, human life, um, and you say, this is my book, and he says, I don't understand, what, what do you mean? How, how would you explain the concept of ownership to someone who'd never heard of it before? Or you could say, this is my house, or this land belongs to me. You know, it's very interesting to take up these, these very obvious things we take so for granted, the whole concept of ownership. You know, what, what does it really mean to say we own something? Mm. And then, uh, and, but even more interestingly, is to bring it within. And we say, this is my body, you know. Well, to what extent is it your body? What does that mean? It's, well, it's, it's me, it's mine. But, but then if we, you know, from scientific point of view, it's that every single cell in the human body changes in seven years. So there's not a single cell, a single physical element of your body now that existed seven years ago. So, what about, there was that previous body yours? Is this body yours? And now it's changing already. Seven years time, if you come back for this retreat, it'll be a different you and a different me, physically. Um, so, is this body mine? Well, let's say this is me, this is my body. Um, let's, how, how important is it that all of the parts of the body are there? So, let's say someone cuts off your arm. Could you still say, this is me, this is my body? Let's say both arms, both arms and both legs. Would you still have that sense of, this is my body? Okay, and then someone takes out a lung and takes out a kidney and, or, and starts replacing bit by bit. To where, where is it still your body? Do you still have the sense of ownership there? Um, if it's your body, then, um, one of the, if we were explaining to the Martian what we mean about ownership, I think we probably come up with an idea, well, it's mine means I can do what I want with it and you can't stop me. If I want to read this book, I have a right because it's mine. If I want to throw it out the window, I can because it's mine. If I want to burn it, I can. If I want to put it on my head, I can do that. It's my book. Yeah. So if I'm not breaking the law, I can do whatever I want with it. So um, the idea of ownership is tied up with the idea of power isn't it? Ownership is a power relationship. You have power over something. Um, but then how much power do we have in our relationship with the body? Yes, if you, um, nobody wants to get sick. So can you, can you tell your body, don't get sick? Nobody wants to get old. Can you tell your body not to get old? Can you tell your body not to die? No. I mean, the most important things that you don't want to happen to your body are all going to happen, whether you like it or not. Or if you go out in the sun, can you tell your body, look, just don't sweat. I really don't want to sweat today. You know, it's a real hassle having to shower here. There's so many people and using the bathroom. I really right not, right, prefer not to sweat very much while I'm here. But you, you can, if you go out in the sun, you're going to sweat. Or, you know, if it's nighttime, you get cold. And you, you can't just tell your body not to get cold or tell your body not to sweat. Um, you can't tell your body not to get hungry or not to get thirsty, can you? So, um, this whole, this whole sort of most basic kind of assumption we have, this is my body. What does that really mean? You know, uh, and, and this is the kind of, uh, investigation that, that we make as, as Buddhist meditators. And in fact, we see that the idea, we have an idea of ownership, which arises and passes away in the mind. And we can, and we can observe that. Now, when, when do we, when does that feeling of this, I am my body, when, when does that appear very strongly? If someone looks at us, if you're a, if you're a young woman and a man looks at you very aware of yourself as a body, you identify with your body. Um, in any kind of sexual situation, you're, you're, you're very identified with your body. Um, if you're in any kind of taxing thing where you're having, uh, you're, you're playing a sport or you're, you're using your body a lot, you're very aware, you're identified with your body. 
But another time when you're reading a book and you're completely absorbed, you might not have any sense of your body at all. So the sense of I am the body or I am the owner of my body is in fact a thought. It's a perception that arises and passes away in your mind. So we begin this investigation of body and mind with the, the very obvious, the body. And then we move on from there to feelings and to perceptions and to thoughts and emotions and consciousness itself. And so we, we can gradually kind of unravel uh, all these um, beliefs and assumptions and ideas we have about who we are. But it's very subtle work. Um, and this is why you need a very um, high level of, of mindfulness and samadhi to be able to conduct this kind of investigation in a very penetrative way. But this is what really we're developing the power to do, the power to sustain attention on our inner world and and look at us, our life and who we are, as I say, not as a philosophical um, argument or a, you, you know, a um, um, kind of theoretical debate, um, but looking at, at our experience itself. 